This week we are in Mark 10. So Mark 10 this week. Uh, to try and catch you up on, on where we've been so far, uh, right at the end of chapter 8, there was a monumental shift in, in the Mark narrative. Uh, at the end of chapter 8, Jesus says, Who do people say that I am? His disciples return with uh, some say Elijah, others John the Baptist, one of the prophets. Jesus says, who do you say I am? And Peter replies, you are the Christ, right? You are the one. You are, you're the guy. Like you're, you're the one, all of our hopes and dreams, you're the one we've been hoping for. But right after that, Jesus follows up with this craziness about, well, you're right, except uh, I'm going to die. And if you want to follow me, you, you'll probably have to die too, right? And so it's this weird take up your cross or take up your noose or take up your lethal injection and, and follow me, right? This, this weird sort of, I have to die to follow you sort of thing, like still trying to figure out what all that means. And the disciples, they don't get it. Um, and so they got that in chapter 8. They, they heard it again in chapter 9, this idea that Jesus is the Christ, except, yeah, he's going to have to suffer and die. Uh, we're going to hear it again in chapter 10. Uh, and so in chapter 10, starts off with a discussion about divorce uh, and then also a discussion about little children. And so in both of those, uh, the, whole, the whole chapter, or at least the chunk that we're going to cover, uh, sort of revolves around this, this idea that, it's verse 31, that many who are first will be last and the last will be first. And so contrary to what you would expect, if you're a Jew, you expect the holy, pious males are going to sort of lead the procession into heaven. Jesus is going to rebuke that and say, uh, no, you can't just divorce your wife for any reason just because she's unlovely or um, she didn't make your meal good enough. You, sorry, you can't just divorce her, guys. Um, in fact, if, if you follow that habit, you'll be last if, if you ever do get to enter. Um, likewise, don't turn the kids away, right? Because women and kids in that society were, they were last. Uh, they were last place. And Jesus is flipping that to say, uh, no, they actually, they might get in before you, you, um, you priests, or you um, think of the parable of the good Samaritan, right? Where it's, it's this half-breed Gentile Jew Samaritan who's the hero of the story, same idea. Jesus is flipping the expectations of people. Um, and then he's going to do it again with this parable, well, not a parable, true story of uh, this rich young, I don't know if, it's just rich young man in Mark. I don't remember if he's called rich young ruler in Mark. I believe he is in Luke. Um, but that's what we're going to pick up the story today. Uh, so if you, if you got your Bibles, um, Mark chapter 10, verse 17 if not, you can follow along on the screen. Uh, I'll read and, and kind of discuss as I go. So 17, says, Jesus started on his way, and a man ran up to him, and he fell on his knees before him. So it's sort of this position of submission. He said, uh, good teacher. Again, this title of, of respect or honor. Uh, good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds, well, why, why are you calling me good? Uh, no one is good except God. And he's going to follow, well, you know the commandments. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Don't defraud uh, and honor your father and mother. Uh, and then he responded, verse 20, he, the, the young man, he said, Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Uh, I don't know if any of you picked out, he didn't list all Ten Commandments. Does anyone, anyone catch which ones we're missing? Can we do a poll and see if we can find them? I'm, I'm just curious. Raise your hand if you think you know one of the ones that we're missing. Boom, that's the big one. Yeah, so he basically listed three through ten uh, and left off the first three, which are no other gods before me, don't have any idols, don't take my name in vain. That's going to come in key to understand uh, what Jesus is getting at uh, with this um, rich guy. Look at 21. Um, again, with those in mind, 
every, every reader who went through Mark in the ancient world would be like, whoa, 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 there's three missing here. What? Right? And, and so that would pop. And so these three that are missing are basically idolatry, like don't, don't worship any false gods, don't have any other gods before me, don't make any idols, and don't take my name in vain. So 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Right? That's key. So he looked at him and he loved him. Right? And so I put it in yellow and to try and get that through your brain. So he looks at him, he loved him, and then he gave him this response. He said, one thing you lack, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. Ow. And so at this, 22, the, the man's, his face fell, and he, he goes away sad because... He was a man who had great wealth. Right, so why did, why did Jesus um, pick on the, the guy's wealth? Right? Uh, apparently, he's a pretty good guy. Right? So he hasn't, he hasn't defrauded anyone. He's taking care of mom and dad. He's not lying, st- stealing, cheating. Uh, he's not killing anybody. Pretty good guy, except uh, he's got one thing that he lacks. And I would argue... it. It's part of the first three commandments. He's, he's got an idol. See what I'm saying? This, this rich young man, he's got an idol. He has formed a god, and he has put that before the true god. Anyone picking up what that idol is? Wealth. Yeah. Right, so he has, he has built his identity and his, his sole purpose. He's built his worth his self-worth on his wealth, right? And that wealth, this rich young man's wealth has gotten in the way of his walk with Jesus, right? That wealth will prevent this rich young man from following Jesus because he's worshiping wealth rather than God. Y'all picking up on that? So Jesus loves him enough Right? He loves him enough to reveal that and say, you're a pretty good dude, but you're, you're missing the mark. Right? Wide is the, the gate that leads to destruction. Narrow, the one to salvation. And Jesus says, I, I, I'm sorry, bud. You've you got to give up everything because you've got this idol in your life. And the only way to get rid of that is to get rid of your wealth and come and follow me. Come and follow Jesus. And so the, the rich young man, he can't, he can't do it. So he, he goes away sad. And so Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. How hard it is. And the disciples, they were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, if you've heard other sermons um, or you're, you're uh, in tune to things, you may have heard at some point that the eye of the needle was a certain gate in Jerusalem, and so it was just a, a narrow gate that was difficult to get your critters through. Um, that's been preached often. It, it's impossible to be true because that gate, there is that gate there in Jerusalem, but it was built in the Middle Ages, um, long after Jesus came around. Um, so, the, Jesus' point here, it's impossible. Like you, because camels don't fit through the eye of a needle. I can't even get a thread through the eye of a needle, much less a camel, right? It's impossible, right? It, it's this preposterous picture of, how do you get a massive critter through the eye of a needle, right? It's just... Never going to happen in a million years. There's no way to finagle that to try and make it work. And so his disciples, rightly so, they're even more amazed. This is 26. They said to each other, then who, who can be saved, man? Like, who? How? Do I, what shot do we have? And so Jesus looked and he said, with man, it's impossible. But not with God. Right? With God, everything, all things are possible. And so Peter said to him, we've left everything to follow you. Sort of a, 
look at us. You know, we are your disciples. We've left everything to follow you. And Jesus, he doesn't really rebuke him. He just says, well, yeah, you're right. You have. And I tell you the truth, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields, basically family or employment for me or the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, and with them persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. I'm I'm tempted to make this text sound nicer and easier, right? I'm, I'm tempted to make you say, whoa, whoa you're okay, don't worry, um, and sort of bring you a bit of comfort. But I, that might be doing you a bit of a disservice at the same time. If there is certainly a, a huge takeaway from this is wealth is dangerous. Like it is dangerous. Right? I mean, it's impossible. Right? It's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, a.k.a. it's impossible for a rich man to get into heaven. And I don't know if you've looked around at, at our society. We are all rich folk, every single one of us. But I don't, if you live in America, you're rich. You're filthy rich. Compared to the rest of the world, you are phenomenally wealthy. I mean, just uh, I, one of my professors said once, he tried to apply Pharaoh's organizing system to a modern American household, and he couldn't do it. We have too much stuff. Like Pharaoh's system for storing stuff is not complicated enough for the amount of stuff, the amount of wealth that a modern-day American has. Like you're richer than Pharaoh. <laughs> you feel that? Like, So all I'd say, every single one of us, myself included, right, and you... Just walk into my office, you can see my pay stubs around my desk, right? We are, we are wealthy, like beyond, beyond all imagination. I mean, just think about it. I don't even have to bail water. I just turn on a faucet and I get running water. I don't have to heat up a shower because I've always got a furnace going. I don't even have to put wood in a fire. Some of you may have to do that, but I don't. Like, I, I just hit a button when I want to be warm, right? I don't... I don't have to worry about security. I don't have to worry about other villages coming in and taking all my stuff or destroying my family, right? I mean, everything that we take for granted, we shouldn't. I mean, we're just, because everyone has it, it, we're just so used to it, right? But the fact that I have, uh, if you were to go into my bedroom, you would see about that, that much of t-shirts that I just don't wear. Like, I have that, that many clothes, and I don't have a lot of clothes, y'all. I mean, like, com- compared to a lot of folks, I'm a pretty simple guy, right? But, I mean, you would see that much, like, two, three foot of just old t-shirts that I just don't wear, right? I mean, we, that's unheard of. The fact that I have so many changes of clothing in the modern-day era compared to ancient folks, I mean... You're talking one, two changes of clothes. I mean, we just, it, again, if you, how many firearms do I have, for goodness sakes? Um, geez, yeah, I've probably got at least a dozen firearms in my house with ammo to go with them. Uh, if you were to look at my knife collection, that's even, it's even more. I have two vehicles. Um, I mean, I'm just, Compared to most Americans, Nicole and I don't have a whole lot of cash, but compared to the world as it stands now and global history, I mean, we're just loaded. I mean, we're just out of the ballpark. So what I'm trying to drive home is every single one of us in this room is in a very, very dangerous position. And you might not even know it. We're like little kids out on 66 with semis flying past us, and we might not have any clue. Right? I mean, that is how deceptive and dangerous wealth can be. That's, that's what Jesus is driving at here. Right? And another point of Jesus here is that God doesn't care about your wealth. 
He's not impressed by your bank account number. (laughs) He's not impressed if you have a full wallet or an empty wallet. God doesn't care. Like, that's not on his... He's just... That is not a top priority to God to make you wealthy. It's just not, right? Let me temper that and give you a bit of comfort. Wealth is not inherently evil. You are not in sin because you are wealthy, okay? You were born into this. It's okay, right? But be careful. Like, be careful, right? Because at some point, you're going to have to make a choice Well, not really at one point. You're going to have to make this over and over and over again throughout your life. Who who is going to be the, what is going to be the dominant narrative of my life? What is going to be the dominant goal of my life? Am I going to pursue Jesus and pay everything for it? Like give, I'll give whatever it takes to pursue Jesus. Or do I want Jesus to just be a nice hobby for Sundays or something that I, I do to make me feel better, but in reality, I'm pursuing this American narrative of wealth and prosperity and safety and security, right? Prosperity is a good thing. Safety and security, they're good things. But when they become ultimate things, um, they'll kill you. Like, they will kill you. They will flatten you like a semi on 66, right? So we are in a very... Very, 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 very precarious spot. All right, we are walking the lip of the Grand Canyon, and we might be blind and have no clue that, right, if I, if I walk here, and then all of a sudden I take my eyes off the prize, boom, I'm, now I just fell into the Grand Canyon. Right, and my, that's, we are walking this ledge just in our society, Okay. So again, it's not wrong to have money. It is not sinful. <sighs> Praise God that he has so richly blessed us. Like, thank you. Like, give him gratitude for that. Like, that's a wonderful thing. But be careful. Like, be careful. Because for this rich young man, the only escape route he had, he was e- he's either facing destruction or salvation. The only escape route he had was to give up everything, to sell everything and become poor. He couldn't do it. And, and so we can only assume maybe later on he repented and, and took Jesus' advice. Um, I don't know. I, I would assume he didn't. Right? And, and so seriously, while I'd, I'm not saying that every single person in this room needs to go sell everything, some of you might. Maybe you might have to sell one thing just to show, to communicate to yourself, if nothing else, that, yeah, you know what? I, Jesus, you are more important. And so I don't, I don't know what's in your garage. Um, maybe it might mean, like for real, I'm, I'm not trying to exaggerate here. Maybe it might mean you intentionally sell your vehicle and go down to a one-vehicle household. It would be frustrating. It would be annoying. It would be a pain in, in the rear, right? Maybe instead of having a boat in your garage, you say, you know what? I love my boat, and I love fishing, and I do. Most kids, when they're 16, get a car. My parents bought me a boat, okay? Um, like I, I, but you know what? I will give up boating for the rest of my life if it means I get Jesus, right? And so if nothing else, just to communicate to myself, maybe... It means I sell my boat or I give away something. Just to, in the Old Testament, they call it a sacrifice. Right? Uh, just give up. It's sort of what Lent is getting after. Maybe for you, the healthiest thing you can do is give up something that you really love and desire just to prove to yourself and to God that, you know what, you, you, are, you are most important in my life. right? And so... Um, I'm not trying to pump myself up with this. Um, I, uh, I don't know. A month or two ago, I sat down with the pastoral relations committee and we set a date to talk about um, finances and if I want to get a raise. That's coming up in October. And so I'm wrestling with this. Uh, um, I, I will, we're, we're growing and I assume you'll offer one. Um, and so I'm wrestling. I'm, 
I could use that cash for sure. Am I going to take it? Like, seriously, I'm, I'm wondering, do I want to take this raise? I'd have more cash. I'd be able to pay off my student loans a whole lot quicker. But I might get less of Jesus in the process. All right, I mean, I, I'm just trying to think, do I, want, do I want the story of my life to be one of wealth and prosperity and a little Jesus on the side or do I want my life to communicate like when all is said and done and someone writes my biography as if you would um, just pretend right Uh, when someone writes that I can it can say yeah he you know he died with a lot of cash in the bank and he gave some off to his kids and um, not that inheritance inheritance is wrong Um, but maybe it will be yeah he gave up a pay raise for 30 years, right? Because he wanted to give that money to the church or because he just wanted to prove to himself that Jesus was more important than, than money. I don't know. That's on the table for me. I'm, I'm seriously considering that. Like just limiting my income just to prove to myself, hey, no, Jesus is he's first priority, not, not the wealth, not the money. Right? That's hard. It screams against everything in our culture. Um, but that's less than Jesus asked of this rich man here in, in the scriptures. And so maybe, I don't know, maybe it's the right call. I don't know. I'm, I'm wrestling with that. And so I just invite you, I mean, think about these things. Give up something that you love just to prove to yourself. Like, let it hurt. I mean, it, it ought to hurt. Um, that, uh, again, not trying to hype myself, just give you a personal example. Um, you remember that knife I put in the auction? Remember that? So that was handmade by me. I, I spent a long time on that. That was my favorite knife. Like, bar, that, was my, that was my... And I... Some people like cars. Some people like... Uh, fashion or, or makeup or, or whatever. I don't know. Whatever you like. But I love like knives. Like if I wasn't a pastor, I would be a knife maker. Right? I mean, they're just, if it's sharp and it's made out of metal, I'm like, oh yeah. All right? And so just f- for that auction, I said, you know what? This is my favorite, but God, you're better than knives. Right? You're better than my hobby. You're better than my passions. Um, so I'm going to give it up. Right? And then next year, in the auction, I'll either make and pour my heart out into another knife and, and give that up or something else that I deeply care about just to prove to myself Jesus is better. Right? And so I just invite you to do the same. Because you can... It'll hurt. I mean, I still want that knife back. right? Not, I do. There was one time I... Anyways, enough about me. Um... <laughs> I, I just invite you do something that'll that'll hurt, but it, it ought to prove to yourself, and you know it'll put a smile on God's face that says, "You know what? I really love this. I, I really enjoy this thing, or I really enjoy my wealth, and it may be something small that you really really care about, um, or it might be, you know, just giving away fifty percent of your your income, or eighty percent, or all, I mean, I don't... Jesus asked this guy to give up everything. And so I can't set a limit on, like, this is enough, but this is too much. There's, there's no too much. Um, but I just invite you, who, who's the God of your life? Are, are you going to pursue this American narrative of wealth and prosperity and safety and security while all the time you might have 70 good years and then you'll spend the rest of eternity with your... I don't know, you don't, you don't really take anything with you, but maybe in the afterlife your idol lives on and you'll spend forever just pursuing and this endless cycle of unfulfilled idols. Um, yeah. We're in a very, very, very dangerous and precarious position. But let me encourage you and end on this note of encouragement, which is how Jesus ends. He says... When Peter comes and he says, we've left everything to follow you. This is verses 29 through, the, through 31. He says, I tell you the truth, Jesus replied. No one who has left home 
or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields. That's basically, man, I can't, I don't know if I can stress how important all of those are. I mean, fields were, that's like giving up granddad's watch or something like that. I mean, that was, that was your family inheritance that had been handed down. I mean, that had theological significance to it. I mean, that was to give up your field or your family in the ancient, especially in, in Judaism, is that was an inheritance that was hard won and divinely given to you by God, right? I mean, that's, that's heavy. But it, no one who gives up one of these things will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, that homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, and with them persecutions, uh, and in the age to come, eternal life. Many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And so I just invite you, and then he follows this up with, again, saying, I'm going to die. Like, I'm going to die. Jesus didn't pursue wealth. He pursued death. Right? He pursued his own death that the world might be saved. I'd rather follow him to that than I would follow American prosperity. I would rather have eternal life than I would riches and fame in this life. And so I just invite you to consider that carefully, feel the weight of this text, and know that you are <laughs> you're in a very dangerous spot. Like you're you're walking that edge. You're you're a kid playing in the road, and you might not even know it. Right? The easy way out is Jesus, because he's better than anything you've got to offer. He's better than wealth. He's better than riches. Uh, he's better than family. He's better than friends. Um, and if you follow Jesus, you'll find that you tend to get a lot of good friends, uh, a lot of good family, um, and all your needs are met. So it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter heaven. With, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. So consider this. Go for it. Take that leap of faith and know that it may seem impossible to you, but with God, all things are possible. Would you pray with me? Father God, I pray that you would open our eyes, uh, open our ears, our hearts to see if we have been pursuing idols, to see if we've been chasing something that is in the end, going to harm us, in the end, going to hurt us and to rob us of joy. I pray that you would just take the scales off our eyes, like reveal our blind spots, show us where we are in fault, love us enough to convict us of our sin, to convict us of our idols, convict us of our love for wealth and riches, that we might give that up to love you because you are better. You're the God of the universe. May we just, I beg you, please, 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 please do not let us pursue creation. Let us pursue the creator. Let us pursue you and not just take your stuff and run because you're, you're better. You are better than anything you've created. And so God, with everything in me, I just beg you that you would lead us into that path, that you would draw us to yourself and that we would forsake all others and pursue you. And we'll love you, Jesus, and in your beautiful name I pray. Amen.